Susan? Yep, Joyce. Good morning to those of you that I can see and to those of you who are online that I can't see, but I've heard your voices and so I know you're with us this morning. So thanks to all of you for joining us in our worship this morning. There are a number of announcements. Um, firstly, there will be coffee following worship because I smelled it in the hallway. Uh, so you're welcome to stop for a cup of coffee and a cookie or two after. And in saying that, um, since Marie has gone to Florida for about four months, we're wondering if there's anyone out there who would like to help with coffee hour. And if so, um, say a word to Susan, not to me, uh, but to Susan, and we'll uh, find a way to allow you to help. So we would appreciate that. Also tonight will be our um, adult Sunday school class online. You should have received your invitation. Tomorrow will be administrative council. The time will be six o'clock, not the usual seven o'clock, because preceding our business meeting will be pizza and some beverages to go with it. So um, that being said, hope that you can join us. Last Tuesday, we were to, supposed to have We Bears meeting at seven o'clock, but that got canceled. So it has been rescheduled for this coming Tuesday at seven o'clock. So there is some busyness ahead. Um, prayer concerns, I think to the best of my knowledge, that list is accurate. I did wanna lift up uh, the name of Mary Ann Flaherty. Um, Mary uh, endured a long and difficult illness. She has passed away 
and online part of her family are Joe and Pat Flaherty. They're with us every Sunday as we worship. They live in Delaware. So wanted to lift that name up and we remember Mary Ann's Flaherty's um, family in our prayers this morning. Anyone else have an announcement? If not, let's join in our call to worship. Our God is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. As God's people, we discover that we have many beginnings and endings, but amid it all, we rejoice in God's holy and eternal presence. Our opening hymn is a familiar one, The Church is One Foundation, stanzas one, two, four, and five. Shall we pray together? O oh, gracious God, as fears and frustrations of daily living continue to haunt us, let us hear your counsel and feel your comfort. Remind us that you are the craftsman of life and that we are your tools. Let us be ready instruments of your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Sarah. I chose this song because it is one of Dr. Martin Luther King's very favorite, favorite, favorite hymns. Sun. 
Sometimes I feel discouraged and think my work's in vain. But then the Holy Spirit revives my soul again. There is a bomb in Gilead to make I've said on other occasions that biblical scholars are convinced that the book of the prophet Isaiah had at least three different authors written in three different time frames. The first was the 8th century BC when the land of Israel was out of control. Behavior was non-existent people were sinning against God. And so that Isaiah wrote lots of words of condemnation about what was to come next. But then the Israelites were carried into exile in Babylon. It wasn't a time then for judgment, but rather a time for comfort. And so second Isaiah writes words of comfort. But then the exile ended and people went back home. And there was a third Isaiah who wrote about the great days that were ahead for Jerusalem and all its inhabitants. And this passage this morning is from that third author. He wrote, I will speak out to encourage Jerusalem. I will not be silent until she is saved, and her victory shines like a torch in the night. Jerusalem, the nations will see you victorious. All their kings will see your glory. You will be called by a new name, a name given by the Lord himself. You will be like a beautiful crown for the Lord. No longer will you be called the God-forsaken land. No longer will you be called the land that God forgot. Your new name will be the land of God's delight, because the Lord is pleased with you. The Lord has made a solemn promise, and by his power, he will carry it out. Let's prepare to pray together.
We offer you our thanks, O wondrous God, for these pedestrian days. Back to a more normal schedule, ordinary days doing ordinary things as we journey through the bleak midwinter. We bring our shortcomings to you. Never are we as good as we want to be. We sometimes fail by what we do, and other times by what we don't do. Only you can perfect us. So we pray this hour that you might remake us and continue to remake us every day of our lives. The justice and righteousness, purity and love reign above us all. We pray for others throughout the world, those who are victims of greed or violence, those oppressed, those who are hungry, those who are alone, those who are unloved. Be their comforter, be their balm, we ask, and where possible, let us be their helpers, serving as your voice, your hands, and your feet. Hear this, our prayer we ask. And now hear us as we pray together silently. Jesus teaches us that when we gather together, we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We will now receive our morning offering.
We pray, O oh Lord, that you might accept the gifts of these your servants and grant that the work to which they are devoted may always prosper under your guidance. Amen. Our hymn is 369. A soldier was attempting to get his paycheck cashed near the military base to which he was newly assigned. I'm sorry, said the merchant who was at the cash register. I can't cash your check without some form of identification. And short of that, do you have any friends on the base who could vouch for you? answered the soldier, sorry, I can't. You see, I'm the camp bugler. The prophets were buglers for God. They weren't popular, just like that camp bugler. I suspect it was never easy to be a prophet in biblical times, because prophets speak on behalf of God. And since the things God would say to us, if given the opportunity, were probably not things we would want to hear, prophets were never popular amidst their varied audiences. There are at least two themes that dominate the writings of the prophets. One is judgment. And the other is hope. As far as the prophets were concerned, 
Israel's greatness as a nation did not depend upon their prosperity and certainly not their military might. These prophets proclaimed that a nation's character was more important than its cash reserves. Israel's wealthy and elite might have it all, but they dare not call it a blessing from God if their lives were corrupt. Thus it was that the prophets pronounced judgment on Israel's sinfulness, and they thundered that without righteousness, without justice, there would come a day of reckoning. Things would not continue like this forever. Their pronouncement of judgment, however, was balanced by the message of hope. They were not all gloom and doom. One of the churches that I served, there was a practice that occurred every Tuesday morning. The church offices were upstairs. My secretary was in the front office and I was in the behind office. Well, every Tuesday morning, a group of ladies met downstairs in the fellowship hall. They were more of the elderly variety and they came to play board games and card games. Nothing wrong with that. But there were two ladies, and one was named Teresa, and the other was named Irene. And we would hear their footsteps climbing the stairs toward the church office every Tuesday morning. Always there was a complaint of some sort. Oh, someone had left crumbs on the floor from a previous gathering, or it was too hot, or it was too cold, or the wastebasket hadn't been emptied, and on and on and on. And so as they made their way up the stairs every Tuesday morning, I would hear my secretary say, John, here come gloom and doom. The prophets were not all gloom and doom. When Israel was hurting, when its people were still attempting to sing the Lord's song even while exiled, when there was famine, when there was war, the prophets again spoke, and they said repeatedly, things will not be like this forever. And they would add, hold tight, God will not forsake his own. So this morning's passage opens with enthusiasm for Jerusalem, the holy city, and the reader is assured that there will be future deliverance and that it will be so dramatic that the city will even receive a new name, symbolic of her new status. So Isaiah says, the nations shall see your righteousness Never again shall you be called the God-forsaken land or the land that God forgot. Your new name will be the land of God's delight. And so the people persevered, and their days hinged on that hope. Now, we too need a message of judgment from time to time. We, just like those ancient Israelites, sometimes violate God's covenant. But there are also times when we need a message of hope. Life gets hard sometimes. And it's difficult to hold on. Just ask our neighbors to the west in the city of Buffalo. The massacre at Topps Grocery Store just a few months ago, and then two violent and dangerous snowstorms that caused both havoc and loss of life, the severe injury to DeMar Hamlin of the NFL Buffalo Bills. There are occasions when life overwhelms us. Life gets hard, 
and it's difficult to hold on. We search for, but don't find the requisite answers. In a college classroom, exam papers were being distributed. And all of the students were busily answering the questions, except one lone student who just peered off into the distance. The professor noticed, and he had instinct enough that prodded him to ask, what's the matter? And replied the student, professor, the questions are too hard. Advised the professor, then put down at least what you know. For those Israelites, the questions were too hard. And that's what Israel cried out in its hour of need. What hope was there if God turned God's back on them? And overwhelmed, we sometimes cry out, what hope is there if God turns his back on us? But Isaiah assures his audiences both then and now, that as we strive to be faithful to our calling into God's kingdom, then God will surely be faithful to us. Is there any hope? Surely there is. If we took an abbreviated look at our church, our congregation, in the year 2000, 22, we would discover that we receive more pledges for this year than any amount of pledges in recent history. Worship attendance two years ago averaged 71. This past year averaged 70. Given the circumstances out there, that's an okay number given the understanding that some churches have increased or decreased attendance, and some churches are even closing. The local ministries we did with you as a congregation were phenomenal this past year. We're going to have a children's time soon with those numbers. Remember the Sunday when we had the big numbers up here? We have so blown those numbers away for the local food pantry, that we're going to follow up on that. Clear Path for Veterans, we continued that ministry. The Christmas Giving Tree, where you put the gift cards on the little tree, we received almost $600 in gift cards so that we can minister to this community. We have never hit that number before. Sunday School, we're really modest in numbers. But for the first year in recent history, we had Sunday school for children, Sunday school for youth, and Sunday school for adults, for those who were interested. All this in a year filled with anxiety, filled with inflation, filled with uncertainty. So is there any hope? I do indeed believe there is hope. Alexander Solzhenitsyn was a prisoner in a Soviet labor camp. And like other prisoners, he worked in the fields, his day a pattern of backbreaking labor, but also slow starvation. And one day the hopelessness became too much for him to bear. He felt no purpose in fighting on. His life, he believed, would make no ultimate difference. So laying his shovel down, he walked slowly to a crude bench at the work site. And at any moment, he knew the guard would order him up. And when he failed to respond, the guard would bludgeon him to death, probably with his own shovel. Often, he had seen that happen to others. So as he sat waiting, head down, he felt a presence, 
And slowly he lifted his eyes. And next to him sat an elderly man with a wrinkled, utterly expressionless face. Hunched over, the man drew a stick through the sand at Solzhenitsyn's feet, deliberately tracing out the sign of a cross. As Solzhenitsyn stared at that symbol, his perspective shifted. He knew he was merely just one against the all-powerful Soviet empire. And yet in that moment, he realized that the hope of all humankind was represented by that simple cross. And through its power, anything was possible. Solzhenitsyn slowly got up, picked up his shovel, and went back to work. Not knowing that his future writings on truth and on freedom would offer hope to millions who had had no hope. So we will hold on in this new year because there is one who will never forsake us. Never again will you be called the God-forsaken land or the land that God forgot. Instead, you will be called the land of God's delight. For us, it is a revelation that God is in the world with us and that amid all the perplexities, we, this faith community, are called to offer excellence in ministry, sensing God's love. And this is the good news for bad times. A man named Milton Wright was a bishop in the United Brethren Church. And it's the church that later merged with our Methodist church, so we became United Methodists. And he would probably not even be remembered today, but for his two sons, Orville and Wilbur. Much of their resolve came from their clergyman father, who in 1910, at the age of 81, flew in a plane piloted by Orville above the Ohio flatlands. Orville feared that the experience might even unnerve his father. But the bishop instead shouted above the combined roar of engine, propellers, and slipstream, higher, Orville, higher. Is there any hope? Surely there is. Even in bad times, our message of hope can be higher, higher. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts, O Lord, be acceptable in your sight. You who are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Another one of Dr. King's favorite hymns. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm and through the night, lead me on to the light. Take Precious Lord.